good evening. Welcome, welcome in the Bali. Uh, and for the people who are joining us via the live stream, also very welcome to you. Uh, my name is Marlijn Geurt. I'm program editor here in the Bali. And I've also been involved in the organization of the Tony Cox exhibition. And that we organized together with uh, the support and the cooperation with the Hartwig Art Foundation. Um, Two and a half weeks ago, we could open the exhibition. We were very happy uh, about that because we had to postpone it for a whole year because of COVID. Uh, but two weeks ago, it was there. We had a really good opening uh, before the Christmas break. Uh, we had good responses. And tonight is extra special uh, because we have the central artist of the exhibition with us. Uh, we are very honored that he joins us tonight. So give a very warm welcome to Tony Cox. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's totally, totally, totally my pleasure, especially after the year delay. There have been so many things that have been postponed and rearranged over the last couple of years that it's nice to see something actually come to fruition. Yeah, we are here with real people in a real, in a real, <laughs> in a real audience, not in a TV space. studio. Um, we invited some people to say something about your work because we thought it would be nice if you could connect and have a dialogue with some uh, people who will look at your work from different perspectives. Um, and there will also be a lot of room for questions from you, because I think we also have an interesting crowd here. Um, but I thought it's also good to start with the beginning, because I think a lot of people have seen the exhibition, or maybe parts of it, uh, but maybe there are also people who are not so familiar yet with your work. Um, so, to start a bit with the beginning, we just uh, watched the recent work that you made. It's Evil 80 Empathy. And this is a special 68 cut made uh, for the pate screen uh, at the Light Supply. You could see it if you walk outside of the Bali. Uh, and like since the 80s, you make videos that look a bit like this. So you have a combination of music and sounds, bright colors. You have a animated text from all kinds of sources. Um, and I was interested that if you look at your art development, you started as a student and you studied photography and creative writing. And in your current work, you don't use any images. And you also don't use any written text by yourself. So I thought, could you share a bit how you developed as an, yeah, from this art student starting with photography to the kind of videos that you make today? That's an interesting like, series of questions and propositions. I would <laughs> probably say um, I wasn't maybe a great photography student, although I did want to sort of learn the discipline in a certain way, but I found myself wanting to incorporate writing with photography, which kind of put me in a strange position with some of my teachers and... and they didn't reason. like it. Yeah, they seemed to think that, um, you know, you hear all sorts of things. This is in the 1980s. And I think, especially with photography, at the time I believe they were very concerned with establishing themselves as a fine art medium, as opposed to the myriad cultural uses to which photography avails itself. And after kind of learning the basics of, let's say, black and white photography, I, was, I became more interested in all those other uses. And so the way in which they, um, the same photograph might function in an archival or political context, or um, might appear in a magazine or newspaper, or could even show up in an advertisement, the same image, was something that was really intriguing to me. And it didn't seem like there were many people who were terribly interested in that multiplicity of uses. And also, in combination with text, um, it became maybe more problematic. Like People would say things like, if you're going to use text in a work, not talking about conceptual art, which actually existed at the time. You know, you will be responsible for the entire history of literature. And I'm like, people use images and words together all the time. Yeah. I'm just interested in maybe doing so in a differential way, um, maybe to cause certain um, productive questions, you know? Um, but anyway, I think that's kind of the genesis. I, maybe I'll go back a little bit further. I started in a really sort of traditional film and television undergraduate program. And I found, you know, probably within the first year, but I wound up dropping out my second year, un, unlike some, you know, people who figure it out, you know, more quickly. And I, I just, you know, I, I 
I saw what professional practice was at that time. I saw the production, for instance, of a local talk show. And it was like, hmm, people's faces change their shapes when that little red light goes on. I'm not sure whether I really want to be involved in a context or industry like this on a daily basis. And so I knew some people who were studying art and at the time it was like, well, I didn't paint and I didn't draw, so I said, well, maybe that's not the path for me. But um, after I dropped out of school, I decided to take a photography course and um, that kind of allowed me a kind of individual mode of practice and a way of beginning to think about, you know, my ideas in that kind of context as opposed to maybe a media industry context. And um, yeah, then I started incorporating language pretty shortly and that got me into some trouble, but. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and if you think about like, you started with photography, with visuals, and after a while, you dropped these images. Is there a particular moment or has there been an incentive that led you away from this image or yeah. is that a gradual process? It's, it's a process in a way. And in many respects, it was led, you know, maybe by what I wanted to do in particular projects. Um, language had been, in my video work, a kind of component. But at a certain point, and I think it was actually in the, mm, I want to say, late 1990s, I decided I wanted to do a project that was kind of about the then contemporary space of music production. I'd become interested in it. Um, a collaborative that I had been involved in for several years kind of went into a kind of musical direction. And I, instead of resisting it so much, I kind of embraced it. And I wanted to do kind of a series of essays that were kind of about that, that project and about the things that I was thinking about in relationship to it. And I thought, oh, it would be great to do this as almost like liner notes for the music project. Yeah. And so I came up with this idea of a series of videos that would be about popular music and relations to it, ways of maybe thinking about it and reconstructing it. And so I decided, oh yeah, that'd be great to just do them with text and not with images. I'll tell the truth, I did a sketch for one of these works that incorporated both kind of very simple um, loops manipulated with um, digital filters. And it was like, it wasn't anything wrong with it. It was just that I felt that it would be more direct to actually do it with language and not, you know, even loop a kind of um, quotidian, you know, music video clip, which I had, you know, kind of done before. And so, as, as often is the case with me, Things take a long time to actually get done and things interrupt. And at the time I was, you know, starting in my first few years of teaching. So there are, you know, lots of things going on. And so it took a while to produce the pieces. In fact, at one point I stopped production because the musical collaboration kind of dissolved. But then it was, it was kind of interesting. I had done a couple and it was like, this is actually interesting. And, you know, in, in my own sort of way of explaining it to myself, I saw it, you know, in some ways as being kind of a hybrid, you know, related to maybe conceptual art practices, but having a different, um, a different subject matter. And um, so that was kind of the beginning of it. Later, I think it had a particular charge with regard to certain classes of imagery, like in the post 9-11 world, I knew that there were certain <sighs> violent images um, that would be provocative, but I was kind of cautious about um, being in the business of recirculating these images and yeah. maybe taking a, a, a page from, you know, somebody like Douglas Hubler who would say, you know, the world is full of images, more or less, do we need to add more to them? I thought it might be more straightforward to actually comment on those images in their absence rather than, you know, yeah, simply... Yeah, then reproduce it. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, so you have this music, you have this text, and I was just interested in um, how do you relate to these kind of texts? Uh, because 
um, how would you say, do you quote them? Do you edit them? Um, how would you describe that relationship with the sources that you use? Because you don't want to reproduce images, but you reproduce, in a way, certain texts, uh, certain music. Yeah. Um, you know, from project to project, I think that varies a little bit, if only to keep myself, you know, sort of engaged and entertained. Um, I have done some projects that were literal restating of, you know, every word, like a transcript. But I've also done things that um, interrupt the text in different ways, um, word by word breakdowns of a text, for instance, in some cases. But most of the time, there are sort of identifiable and legible, you know, phrases and parts of things. Sometimes they're more or less edited. There are sometimes when I will take two or three texts and juxtapose elements of them. Other times I will literally massively quote from a single source. And you know, some of that depends on what the project is, but also depends on the text. I mean, on occasion I've found texts that do what I would normally do in terms of um, collaging a text already. Like, for instance, in um, Evil 16 torture music, I found this you know, text, and I had done a fair amount of research, both in the journalistic field and in the academic field, on the subject of music in relation to so-called enhanced interrogation or torture. Um, and it, through the process of reading and thinking about how to you know, juxtapose things, I you know, found this text that actually I didn't use the entire text, but I used a pretty large chunk of it. And one of the things that attracted me to that particular text was that it kind of went through a number of different filters and categories so that it was not univocal, but it was interesting that you know, some of it was you know, academic, theoretical. Some of it was like a reading of ways in which um, audiences and journalists had responded to the use of, you know, of music in torture. And so um, that's you know, one example where it was more or less, you know, I made a selection. I can't say that I really edited it. Other times, you know, I will actively go through a given text, reading often for something. And sometimes you know, it may not be the major subject or the, the original subject of the text but something that, um, through making editorial decision, emerges. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of people use the word DJ if, 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 you, if they think about the artistic practice that you have. Do you actually think yourself that's a good word to describe <laughs> what you do? Um, in some ways, probably, yes. I mean, the, maybe the, the clearest way in which you, you could say that that's central to me is that you know, I will be thinking conceptually about what the piece might be about. I may start gathering possible texts to use. Um, but usually the first thing that I actually commit to is the sound. And often I choose the sound not, strictly speaking, because it's the most appropriate, quote unquote, music that one could choose, but rather because I believe that the the musical sensorium is a way of actually adding material and making maybe the text more complex in certain ways. So, um, so you're I, looking for this relationship between the music and the text. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like a construction. I prefer that there be maybe certain distances between the music and the text than have them be, you know, coded either in, in terms of genre or in terms of... Um, I don't know, social context being similar. And I violate my own rules all the time. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I, I tend to like to have a certain distance. So, you know, the vernacular way of expressing it would be, it gives the viewer something to do other than, you know, match, you know, the music to the text. Yeah. It's like you kind of have to maybe think, I don't know, a little bit expansively or think in layers about those relationships and what might be possible for them. Because on a certain level, I feel almost as though, you know, I, I tell people I don't do period soundtracks. 
you know, if I'm going to do a piece about the 1980s, you can rest assured it's either something from the 60s that I'm listening to or something that I'm listening to contemporaneously. That, you know, it's sort of like, well, why would you even, you know, do that? I mean, in a certain way, I think it's maybe also part of an ongoing um, complication that I want to make. Yeah. With maybe traditional modes of documentary practice. Um, I love documentaries, actually. Um, it's just that it's almost like, again, they're an object that exists, and I'm not sure whether I'm the best person to do those. So if I'm going to take up those subjects or those relationships, say, with testimony and transcripts, which I work with you know, fairly consistently, um, I'm also at pains to produce something that adds some distance and some maybe requires a kind of relation to that's not strictly speaking um obvious yeah you know that i, yeah, I if wanted it matches too well you don't like it i no. don't like it it no. kind of irritates me i'll be honest <laughs> yeah. and it was interesting Or, because you're also a professor you're teaching um how are those two practices your artistic practice and your teaching practice related because i was thinking You're also educating your students. Do you feel like with your artistic work, there's also part of education in it? Or are these two do totally different? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, I don't know. I found teaching to be productive in many yeah. ways. Um, some of my closest friends today are former students. Um, some of my collaborators have people that we've worked with in a classroom situation. But also, I think... I don't know. I, I I guess early on I, you know, came to a belief that you could argue that all culture teaches something, you know, or inculcates or reproduces certain values, and so I, it would be kind of yeah dumb to say that it wasn't part of what yeah. I, I do, and you know I've tried to not in a kind of literal way but to make that information, if you will, or knowledges or complexities available. Um, and whether you know, people necessarily would match what I you know, thought about it in, in kind of intentionalist terms, I don't know whether that's you know, in itself useful. But yeah, I like the idea that you know, work can speak back to particular histories, modes of representation. Why shouldn't it? Yeah. Um, and maybe be somewhat explicit in its methodology that it wants to produce differential meanings or contest, or contest you know, again, so-called, you know, obvious yeah. conclusions. Or and to delve a bit deeper into the the artistic process, um, because I read sometimes that you're like mostly working on five, six works at the same time. Yeah, I like to do that because. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For one thing, it saves me from the problem of um, this isn't working and what am I going to do about it? You know, instead of sitting there and just sort of grinding on, you know, a problematic. You know, I've even found it helpful, um, like in the case of the pop manifestos that I was discussing earlier, to put something away for a while and do something else or think, some, think about something else. And, and, and when, when do you decide it is finished? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sometimes, because if you t like to put it away and then like you come back to it, and then what what does it need to say like yeah now it's there? For example, like if we if we think about for example the video that we saw in the beginning, maybe it's easier to look at a certain video. You start with a certain idea, I think, for this video. Often, yeah, um, but you know sometimes it's not hyper specific, and sometimes when I'm looking through the materials like the text or considering the music, I began, you know, to clarify at least to inform myself what the thing is about. And sometimes that's, you know, maybe easier and more linear as a process than others. Sometimes I've been frankly confused by um, some of the things that I've done. And in, in large part, that's kind of why they get shelved or put away. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's interesting what that kind of distance can do. Sometimes I go back to a work that's in that kind of shelf state and say, 
almost immediately, oh, I know what to do here, you know, what's quote unquote missing. And other times I have the uncanny feeling that there's nothing wrong. It was just that, you know, I'd been maybe too focused on a particular idea about what the piece should be. And when I have a little bit of distance from it, I see that, yeah, it does something. I don't know whether it does what I initially started out to do, but it does something and might be worth, you know, releasing to a public. But yeah, some of it, I'll, I'll be quite honest, has to do with me and how I, you know, operate and, and, make, and make work. Um, it's, I, I wish I could say that, you know, it's always like clear that what the missing ingredient would be. But sometimes it's like, Maybe just the focus on a particular, you know, process or practice is the thing that keeps me from, you know, kind of fully engaging with it. Um, a lot of the time, I think I, you know, work out of to figure out something. You know, um, if I knew what I was going to do and why I was doing it, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, it would be less interesting. You know, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't concentrate on it. I couldn't engage with it. So that's a part of it, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to go to what I said. Uh, we have invited some people to say something about your work. Hey. Um, <laughs> you like that idea. Yeah. Um, and we have asked uh, two people to say something. And we start with Edwin Carlos. Um, he's going to say something about the work of Tony from a cinematic uh, perspective. He's a curator, writer, and lecturer and researcher at the School of Arts Kask in Ghent. He has been active for many years as senior programmer and curator for the International Film Festival in Rotterdam. And he publishes essays related to media, archaeology, visual arts, film, and animation. So the floor is yours, Edwin. Give him a applause. Thank you, uh, Madeleine, for inviting me and being stubborn enough to invite me again after a year and all the delays, and for reuniting me with Tony, who indeed I've met Ages ago, 20 years ago, I think was the first time, but we hadn't seen each other in a long time. So I'm, I'm super happy with the occasion and also to dive into the, the more recent work, uh, works like After the Studio, etc. Um, I didn't really know if the exhibition had a title here. It wasn't on the banners yet. I didn't know if the evening had a title. For me personally, I'm also a teacher at a film school. I say titles are very important. Um, do I have a title? Uh, no. Well, one could be when the discursive becomes immersive. That's a really heavy one, uh, forget about it. But it's maybe the, the thing that I really, really intrigues me about your work is this, this two legs of, of being very serious and at the same time being very engaging and very, I mean, it's, it's also the music and text balance uh, that's going on. Two things, um, I, I took two quotes, one from one of your articles or, or interviews and one from one of your tapes just to base or to gather my thoughts uh, around here for tonight uh, in 10 minutes or so, Merlene. Um, the quote by, by Tony himself is, I'm interested in the resonances, the rehabitualizations and the echoes of a historical moment in the contemporary or what you just said in one word, distance. Distance in time here. I think that's super important. That's also going to be uh, the first part of what I'm trying to present here. And the second part is a quote used by you or quoted, uh, but it's from Tiho Segal, who says, I don't think there's anything meaningful in art beyond the exhibition, or I could say beyond the exhibiting, beyond the moment of sharing the work. I think that's also, again, very, very important. And maybe you can have a, a dialogue about this after my brief monologue. Um, so no title and... Oh yeah, this is a picture from early years. Uh, I thought there was another image. Yeah, there's one gone. No, never mind. Um, first time, so the occasion to meet um, those many years ago was actually double again. Uh, I was working as a programmer in Rotterdam, so as a film programmer, and I was programming you as a filmmaker. But I was also working in a museum in Antwerp, the MUCA, Museum of Contemporary Art, where I desperately wanted to get out of the black box and into the white spaces, the white cubes of the museum, which it didn't really allow me to in the first place, uh, or first instance, but you're not using the auditorium, I said, um, or hardly. So why can't I do things about sound, music, in the auditorium? It would make sense. And that's when we, uh, 
played with the pop manifesto, play them out in, in a kind of spatial setting rather than uh, the linear one-off um, form as presented in, in cinema. And so one of the most memorable moments, maybe it was one of the last moments that we were actually together in a space in Rotterdam was with this massive a lead wall in the Rotterdamse Schouwburg, where um, in 2013 you showed Pop Terror Critique, a remix, which was also, I think, one of the first times you had a kind of overview show in, in, in the States, and you brought it together on a very wide screen. Um, this playing with ways of display is what really intrigues me and has been striking me over uh, the past years in to see how your work really came to the fore in many, many different ways. As a film programmer, as a curator, I think it's all about combining combinations. And uh, so I hope to, to have a dialogue about this. Uh, but first, I want to go back and, and maybe share a bit of my thoughts, my old brain. Your work is about having people read things and think things at the same time. So I'm just sharing the thoughts I had this week while kind of reminiscing of, of your work. And it might be a bit formalist, but every tape ends with concept plus form, Tony Cox. I think it's the two are really, really entwined, really together. So um, first thing was, oh yeah, he's a pop manifesto, so a kind of deconstruction of the music video. That was my initial reading, and immediately I thought of maybe books, I don't know, I didn't check with you, books you read or you came across uh, at art school, I did. Um, Grail Marcus, his Lipstick Traces, a book that is, I quote him, is not about music, it's about a common voice. It's discovered and transmitted in many forms. Um, Lipstick Traces is a book that takes its cue from the punk period, Sex Pistols, but it's about angriness, about the absolute demands of uh, people, demands on society, on art, and all the government, governing structures in everyday life. So I think, again, your work is about the music industry, it's about society, it's about much more than what seems to be uh, maybe under the title pop manifestos hidden. Or maybe the, the combination, the conflation of pop and manifesto is already uh, indicating that. Um, Dan Graham is another writer who also made videos and made pavilions, and I read that somewhere that some of your earlier works were shown in Dan Graham pavilions. Um, he's most famous perhaps for his book Rock My Religion, but before that there was a film that was again uh, tapping into this uh, vibrant music scene of the 70s to say things that go much beyond purely the, the musical. Uh, here's one of his pavilions. Uh, Curiously, my texts are not appearing. I did my best to... Anyway, never mind. Um, that's one of the things that flashed through my, my, my memories when, when thinking about your work. Another one is uh, structural film. Yeah, indeed, all my, my titles are missing here. It's, it's okay. Structure, this is Paul Sherrod. Um From the 70s, 60s and 70s, there was a strong movement both in, in the States and in England uh, on film about film, film as film, they said in England, uh, a film that is radically self-reflexive, a practice that is reflecting on its own making. Uh, in structural film, content is subservient to the language and the physical materials of film. Uh, the physical materials actually can constitute the entire content of the work. And I think this deconstructing of videos to its barest minimum was something that really appealed to me. And I, I dare to raise this subject uh, because since a couple of years, uh, Tony Cox is represented at, uh, by the Green Naftali Gallery in New York, which also represents the now deceased uh, legacy of both Paul Sharitz and Tony Conrad, another one of these household names of structural filmmaking. Uh, in Micro House, which will be a kind of a focus uh, for the uh, third part of the day, of the evening, um, it begins with a very strong flicker, black and white, which I think relates back to the flicker films that Tony Conrad made, Paul Sharitz made, of pure, very aggressive often, um, provoking sometimes epileptic seizures, uh, work that could also be described as visual music. It's not about something, it's really abstract, it's pure uh, sensation, it's pure experiential. And somebody like Tony Conrad was indeed also a musician, somebody who is as influential in the minimal music, uh, who discovered the name The Velvet Underground for the band, uh, but also made these uh, flicker films. 
And he made also this kind of, and that taps into your maybe interest with color, or at least something I uh, associate with it. Um, these are his yellow movies from 73. And these are the, like, the least action-packed films you can imagine. The only action taking place is the yellowing of the white paint. So uh, they're very slow. Um, but I think there's a kind of a lineage or maybe tradition or just a, uh, a shared mentality. Uh, with, with At least that's what I bring in when I see your work. And another thing, uh, a person I remember uh, very well and is Bruce Connor. Again, texts have disappeared. Bruce Connor is maybe, or some people say, the inventor of the music video, although he was working on film. In 58, already made a film called A Movie, and it's purely found footage. And uh, he was like one of the first filmmakers who decided that I don't have to shoot film in order to make film. I don't have to write text in order to work with text, is I think a kind of parallel with, with, with what you're doing. Uh, and again, Bruce Connor is somebody who showed the medium as it is. He didn't only narrate something, but he showed that this is what it is, this is how it works. Um, who was interested in punk music. He shot the West Coast punk scene in the 70s and who made, uh, indeed, pop promos. These are examples for um, uh, David Burns and Brian Eno's collaborations um, in the bush, or what's the title again? In the bush of ghosts. Yeah, in the bush of ghosts, yeah. Um, mea culpa and America's waiting to pop promos. Um, another person who flashes through my mind is Jean-Luc Godard, somebody who is as obsessed with typography as he is with images, and who, again, doesn't, doesn't, is not ashamed to steal or to borrow or to appropriate, if it's appropriate or inappropriate, but he just appropriates text and images from the history of cinema, from the art history, from literature, etc., cetera, um, to provoke and not to be, he's very upfront, the typography is, again, in your face, it's very clear, very bright often, but at the same time, very uh, confusing. Um, further back, so I'm, I'm rewinding a bit, is uh, the Lettrist cinema, less, less known. It's very French, but in the early 50s already, there were people like Isidore Izou and later on Guy Debord, who produced something that was cinema, uh, but actually proclaimed the death of cinema. And this ambivalence between wanting to make a video or music video at the same time deconstructing until it's barely anything left is something I saw already happening perhaps in, uh, in terms of cinema with the letterist filmmakers. Um, and an important concept they also came up with, particularly Guy Debord, was uh, what he would call psychogeography. When your work leaves the cinema and ventures into the city, I think and stumbling upon work by Tony Cox without knowing what it is can be kind of a trigger that maybe is in attuned to what the situation is did, what Guy Debord proclaimed, uh, psychogeography, wandering in the streets. Maybe your work is also kind of psychodiscography, kind of working with that, but that's just a pun, obviously. Um, and maybe you can go even further back into silent film, of course, and maybe too old-fashioned to, to, to be mentioned, but at the same time, somebody who quickly gathered what was cinema, what was this medium of moving images, what was this combination of image and text in silent film, um, was Duchamp with his uh, anemic cinema of 1926, the only film he made, um, where he alternated between text and a kind of uh, illusionary abstract um, uh, spaces or graphic uh, patterns. Um, actually, I like the patterns at the side of here. They're kind of reminiscent, particularly also of the um, it's not, yeah, the rotor reliefs, where you see the element of music coming in even more clear, because he specifically designed them to be played on a turntable. So here you have this idea of uh, uh, op art, kinetic art, and actually pop art all uh, conflated into one. Uh, creating a kind of um, multiple. It was on sale since the 1930s, 35. He started selling them and we issued them a number of times. I know by now that you're also reaching kind of uh, strange objects as book objects uh, recently. And of course, Duchamp with his bicycle wheel is the object through phase, already the found object, as we know uh, from, from early on in art history. Something that is continuing in the found footage, but also in maybe the found quotation traditions. 
And I'm a Belgian, so I have to mention Marcel Brutas here, who also came up with the idea like a film can be text, but text can be an object. And uh, this is one of his most famous uh, projects, Le Corbeau et le Renard, the, the crow and the fox, um, who saw language as image, who foregrounded text uh, until it became almost so obvious that it became alienating again. Uh, I think, again, strategies that also are, are in play at your work, and who liked also the notion of multiplication. He was a poet who didn't sell, his books didn't sell, so the first object he made was actually cementing his unsold books into an object and then became a visual artist. Um, and one of the things he really liked to do was also, uh, there was a recent show in Brussels of all his industrial uh, plates that he said, well, let's choose very kind of common materials uh, and, and yeah, subvert them, play with text. Uh, what everybody thinks is very common, uh, maybe it's not. Uh, and maybe it's also a canvas, kind of plastic canvas for poetry. Uh, even further back, and it's a little sidestep, but it's actually the most recent project I curated and will happen in uh, Rotterdam in two weeks' time. Uh, it's a project by Steve McQueen called Sunshine State where he deconstructs the jazz singer. Curiously, the first um, music film, the first talk, he was actually a film about music. It was also a very ideological film. It's one of the rare films where uh, Jewish uh, um, lifestyle is actually quite f depicted quite fully. But of course, it's mostly known for its now very, very kind of a dubious use of blackface. Um, McQueen, who is taken a very different route from you in terms that he's very visual, he's overtly visual, uh, but also very immersive, very sensorial, I think, and that's something you might have in, in common, um, made a piece where he deconstructs uh, the jazz singer, and as soon as blackface is added on the face, it's being removed. So it becomes an invisible man, which is, again is an important reference in, in American uh, black literature. Um, McQueen also recently wrote uh, an introduction to uh, a book on structural film in the UK and say that's where he comes from, which one wouldn't expect if one sees his TV films or his Hollywood films. Um, so voila, that's all what's taking place in my head when I just delved into your work again uh, over the past week. Um, I think we share, everybody shares the importance of music, particularly in the... Um, teenage years where music is instrumental for identity formation and then you discover that actually this music is an industry, it's an entertainment, it's completely programmed, controlled, etc. It's both organic, it's authentic, but it's also a commodity. Um, it's colorful, the work I see here, but it's also cerebral. It's rational, but it's also physical. It's the music versus the text, it's the lyrics versus the beat, it's kind of dancing on the edge of a volcano, I would say. Uh, that's the feeling I sometimes get when I see particularly the more urgent recent works. There's a strong discursive current, but there's also this immersive physical reaction one has. Uh, there's no split between the mind and the body, I would say. And above all, they are compositions. They're compositions composed of things that are a bit distant from each other in time, uh, in rhythm, uh, in animation, uh, before people started swiping their phones, you already wiped one image after another, and you keep doing this, these page turners, um, turning an exhibition space uh, into a reading room, or even the street into a reading room. Uh, and I would very much like to talk about this and how you multiply your screens and your ways of presentation. I had some images which I think uh, I, didn't, I wasn't aware, but you already showed how, you know, how many diverse ways your works are popping up, and this is not exhaustive. Uh, from a simple gallery setting, double imagery, so you don't know what to read or to look at first, small screens, uh, very specific interiors, uh, libraries, um, a bench or not a bench to sit or to walk through. A very, very, very big difference between, I guess, again, the filmmaker and the installation artist. Um, to these big, um, yeah, in situ and unique presentations that are almost like a remix, perhaps, of individual works. I would 
like to hear what your uh, thoughts are on this. And um, up until Piccadilly Circus, no less. I mean, of course, we have the play, Let's Say Plane now, so that's uh, upstaging it or not. Um, voila. I think I'll, I'll leave you to this. We're back in Rotterdam for that LED wall, and maybe we can talk a bit more about the multiple screen uh, evolution in your work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Please you. join us. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I start with would you like to give a reaction? <laughs> I that was a good reaction. <laughs> it is a good reaction. Actually, it's a fascinating sort of set of genealogies, and I would probably say almost to a person, um, the sources that you cite have had some impact on the way that I view my practice historically. And it's interesting that there are people who are filmmakers and people who are not. Um, and that makes sense, perfect sense to me. Um, I think in many ways, I think things that seek to extend or to question like boundaries between disciplines have traditionally been important, you know, to and for me. Um, some things, you know, are more kind of um, almost at an affective level in terms of my relation. Other things, you know, I have quote unquote studied, you know, as models. And that's also interesting that, you know, it's not like the same in each case but you know, a variety of, say, modalities and addresses that happen. Um, I'm tempted you know, not to concentrate on the citations too much, but then maybe that's because I want to talk about other questions. But I'll, I'll try to go through it you know, relatively quickly. I think as a young maker, probably the ideas around situationism and the lettrism that preceded it were really, really important to me, I guess because you know, I wanted to draw certain connections between media and society. And it seemed as though Debord's work in particular sort of did a kind of really great job of doing that. Yeah. And of course, I explicitly quoted um, from one of the SI essays in an early work, largely because, not because I felt that it was exhaustive but rather it just sort of represented a reading and a take on, say, um, the civil disobedience and, you know, rebellions of the 1960s. One that, you know, seemed like I wasn't hearing in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, well, if, if this can be evacuated, is there a way of um, countering that or at least putting those questions back into play? Um, I think, again, obviously with, let's say, a practice like Dan Graham's in particular, um, Rock My Religion, both the film and the book, you know, were kind of important, both as kind of showing, even if I disagree with the arguments they made in the video mm -hmm. in, in very, you know, particular ways, the thing that I really kind of respected and admired was the fact that he wanted to make that kind of argument in that kind of form. And so it was almost as though, it pointed out to me, and I'm not alone in this, um, some of my peers feel very much the same way. It's like, you can do this in a kind of almost punk ethos. It's sort of like, you too, you know? It's not like you have to wait, you know, or um, know exactly what the results will be, but you too can maybe construct arguments that are not, um, strictly speaking, um, logical, um, or that recruit a variety of materials to that argument. And of course, you know, structural film has kind of been important to me, almost in a kind of, I often tell my students that all influence is not positive. Sometimes if you have certain questions or problems with things that you see and hear, that those can be maybe even more productive than the things you love, you know? Um, it's not always about that, at least not for me. I think, you know, one of the things that I'm drawn to maybe in structuralism, is the desire to kind of decode and lay out um, what the effects and affects are and how they're sort of produced and extended. But it was almost as though, because they were often films about film, mm 
I kind of wanted to have two types of structural analysis happening simultaneously. You know, the thing that brings your attention to the fact that you are watching something that is produced in particular ways. And I don't know, I somehow thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to align that with a critique of the society in which these things occur? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't necessarily, as I think the historical record will show, they don't have to be directly, you know, or explicitly linked, but is there a way that one might, you know, attempt to do that? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's almost like a double, you know, a two-layer, you know, I'm looking at two different kinds of structure maybe simultaneously or in layers. Um, and, you know, I'd say maybe my enjoyment and ambivalence about popular music has that kind of resonance too. Um, it's like it's a material that could be used, but it could be used for very different maybe purposes than it is commonly used. Mm -hmm. And what happens if you kind of take that as a, a structuring, you know, mechanism or a way of thinking? Um, I'm trying to think, what else? It's a lot already. It's, it's super, <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, we can go because that's of interest to Edwin. But and oh, I, I did want to yeah. bring focus to the first thing that you said about, um, or at least what I've recorded is the first thing you said, about the use of um, exhibition practices mm -hmm. yeah. as a kind of extension or continuation of making work which is something that I have become fascinated with. And I think in large part because of some of the opportunities that I was given when you were working with um, International Film Festival Rotterdam. It's like a chance to think about your work in a broader temporal, um, sonic, and or even you know, um, sculptural context, yep. as opposed to you know, things seen on a screen. And you know, that's kind of where they belong or meant to exist. Do you still feel as a filmmaker? Because that's how you were presented to me. Like, oh, there's these short the, films made by a maker yeah, in New York. That's, that's a, that's What's a the state of mind now? Yeah. yeah, that's a complicated question. Because on one level, I was making these things and making them you know, with you know, some training and knowledge of both, say, practices like structural film or the essay film, which I have a great deal of admiration for. And some say that there are, you know, essay films without the film, uh, <laughs> that they are, you know, turning yeah. essays into a kind of visual and sonic phenomena. Um, interested in those things, but I'm not sure whether I would consider myself a film person or a filmmaker. I mean, I have friends and colleagues who very much consider themselves part of those traditions. Um, and so it also makes me kind of keenly aware that I, I don't participate in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, it's not that I'm against film. Um, it's just that I, I feel that maybe there are certain desires and expectations that, say, the love of film, you know, produce and provoke that I kind of have ambivalence about. You know, it's like, that's great, but is that, you know, what I want to do or yeah. how I see what I do? It's Which not is, your finality. It's not where you're... you're you see your work ending up. Uh, yeah, and sometimes, you know, it's not even necessarily the best or only place for the work to wind up. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think, you know, again, I discovered maybe through practicing in, you know, um, installation, public and or semi-public context that, you know, that was very, very different than the desires and expectations that motivated people to come to a screening venue. Yeah. And, and, and maybe it's interesting if you think about how the work is exhibited in the Bali. Like it's a very different place than a museum or maybe a cinema. Like if you, when we started with this, uh, this idea to exhibit here in the Bali, what do you want to add to the building or how would you like to relate to the building of the Bali with the work that you make? I mean, how do you think about that? Yeah, it's when I do installations where I'm, you know, intimately involved in, you know, all the decision making, that has been my tendency. Um, simply because, you know, for me, it's almost again an opportunity to reconfigure the work, to rethink it, or to re edit it in some cases, as opposed to, you know, seeing the works as fixed, you know, object like um, phenomena. I've, I've kind of also, you know, wanted to go kind of back to the book as a source material and, 
you know, as something that has been, you know, complicated or um, reconfigured, you know, through my making process. And so, yeah, I mean, issues of what is a book and um, how does it relate, say, to the video um, are kind of interesting questions for me. But yeah, I think also the different kind of both space and time that um, exhibiting in spaces can, you know, um, initiate and, and trigger, not just for me, but for viewers, you know, that it's like, oh, the thing that you think you knew and understood, say, from seeing it, I don't know, streamed or on a computer, mm -hmm. can be radically altered by its presentation, that it's not as stable as it might appear. Well, you're destabilizing your own work by often showing two works at the same time or two or three screens or even multiple screens in Munich. It was a lot of, uh, yeah. it was like a chronology of your work, but in one space, um, that's a lot to take in. I mean, that's like uh, not multitasking, but multi text reading, um, which is a completely different experience and an impact from, say, a linear viewing. Yeah. And, and do you, how do you approach that? Or do you, is that a very, it's, it's like, is that a remix thing, uh, or I'd, how would I'd, you I'd describe say it's it? it's pretty it's reasonably maybe closer to a remix than almost anything else I can think of. Yeah. You know, when you take something that would have been and perhaps you know is linear, and you choose to kind of juxtapose it with versions of itself, you know, at different times, and I kind of like that idea that you know it could be juxtaposed with another work. Or it could be juxtaposed with the same work, but at different stages in its linear progression. And then you have them kind of arrayed together so that, you know, one way of looking at it is if you're taking on the multitasking model, you get to see more of the work in less time. If you, <laughs> if you take it as a kind of intervention or disruption of the linearity of each individual channel, then it reads differently in, in, that, in that respect. It challenges the viewer slash visitor a lot more yeah. if you have to take in so much or a lot less because, you know, like, I'm overwhelmed. This is... Uh, um, but at the same time, I mean, what you, say, you have to... I mean, you're activating the viewer all the time. It's not about what is on the screen. It's about what is going on in your mind. Yeah, or maybe screen. even in your body, I was thinking. Yes, yeah, sometimes in yeah. the body, in which, you know, I think there's... How should I put it? There are relations and knowledges there as well, which is, you know, some people think that engaging the body is kind of taking away from an analysis or an understanding. And I would probably argue that there's, you know, knowledge and understanding being produced both in the body and in, you know, the eye and the mind. Yeah. And that it's possible that they can actually inform one another and in kind of complex and useful ways. Mm -hmm. Because do um, you also play with, I was just thinking sometimes, um, I have a bit the urge or maybe to understand. So if you, if I see a text, if I start with watching a work of you, you have the idea like, okay, I have to read this. I have to understand all of this. Do you kind of play with that? Um, I hope so. I mean, I hope I complicate it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not a kind of linear completist. You know, it's like, as opposed to thinking, I have exposed everything. All the information is here. Um, you should, at the end of one iteration, be able to get and understand it. I don't believe in that, you know? It's sort of like, that's not, it, that doesn't even operate for me as someone who is putting the work together. So I don't have any expectation that a person should just get it you know, and get all of the elements and all the references. That would be impossible. You know, I'd even, you know, push it a little bit and say that's not even possible for me to be fully present in that way to all the things that might be... That come into play. Yeah. 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 You know? But you do also make uh, single and static work, like like street banners uh, printed. Uh, we we saw, saw a few posters. Billboards, that's, again, another uh, way of... Um, how does it translate to these situations? Or what is the appeal for you there? It's kind of agitprop insertions? I, yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, I think, at least for me, one of the reasons to do that in the first place is to want to complicate the you know, near ubiquity of advertising messages. 
and you know, being maybe on some level aware that a lot of you know so-called avant-garde techniques have been recuperated and taken on by mm -hmm. you know advertising industry to sell things. That it might be interesting to use language and spaces as a way to maybe question those you know mm -hmm. expectations and habits. Right. I have well, if I can. Um, yeah, sure. no, I'm very intrigued. Also, like I know your work since since, since 20 years somewhat. Um, it's been very consistent, Longer. very recognizable. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, technology has changed dramatically. I mean, drastically and mm. dramatically. Whereas you do stick to a certain form, certain language or, or grammar that you developed. Um, I mean, you expand your, your expressions in, in terms of poster or more public space, but not in terms of technology that much. Is that a kind of con uh, con conscious rebutting of this enormous the evolution that we are going through. Yeah, I guess that's my maybe one sort of trope of resistance. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I really believe that all the technological changes um, result in, I mean, they may result in changes in consciousness and how people process information. But unfortunately, I'm a skeptic with regard to um, you know, it, it seems as though one of the historical um, ideas about technology is that there is a direct connection between technological change and social change. I'm just not sure I ever have believed in that. So acceleration, I, perhaps? Uh, acceleration, Acceleration, perhaps. yeah, perhaps. Um, just, you know, why dissemination? Yeah, possibly. But, yeah, I'm not, yeah, no. not sure, you know. In fact, you know, I, there's, you know, people have both for good and ill said that my work often appears to be very simple, that I'm not trying to do the most complex thing that one could do with text and sound. Honestly, yeah. And, you know, it's like, that's right, you know, <laughs> because I want maybe there to be some e even fragmentary possibility for like legibility. Um, and I don't think it's, so medium specific, which is another thing that maybe I've had quarrels about or with, mm -hmm. you know. Um, for me, it's more about, you know, delivery approaches for ideas, maybe primarily, and now maybe more so affects, and the idea that affects and ideas can kind of exist simultaneously in the human subject, that it's not like one banishes or the other, the other yeah. right? Yeah. But um, now it's about, like, more the formal aspects of your work and that you didn't change that. But do you feel that audiences relate different to your work because of the digitiz like digitalization yeah. of, of, of People society? People are used to swiping. That, yeah. that may be true. Yeah, I would probably agree to that. That mm -hmm. people, it seems maybe more, um, more vernacular in a strange way. Yeah. Even though when I started doing it... do you think about that? It, because I'm curious. Well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm happily surprised about the... Um, the proliferation of your work now to, to, to a much higher level. I mean, over the past years, for most people, lockdown years and, and being really restricted, I think it's a blossoming of your work everywhere. I think but, yeah, partly, I of would course, probably agree with you. Yeah. You know, my technical regime has not, yeah. you know, it's like completely repudiated. It's almost as though, you know, some of the things that I had done were maybe, you know, constituent properties of the digital yeah. Before there was the technology mm -hmm. for that, that's a possibility. Yeah, but I think but I mean, I obviously there's a more sense of urgency to read also your your, your early works now and, and revisit them. At the same time, what you mentioned as, as vernacular, people read them easily, more easy. Mm. Uh, everybody's now kind of text driven and and and, very, and multitasking very between that, all yeah. those things. Yeah. So um, the public caught up perhaps, in a certain Maybe. sense. Yeah. 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 Um, we have to go to a, okay. another speaker. Uh, so I, if it's okay, because we can also, with the, all the questions, build up on this. But yep. for now, thank you so much. Um, uh, and I would like to introduce a second speaker, um, because we're also going to look at your work from the perspective of music. Uh, we invited Maarten van Hinten. He's a writer, teacher, hip-hop artist, and uh, most of all, the creative brain, brain sorry, behind the Urban Production House right about now. 
Uh, in his work, he is uh, inspired a lot by his fascination for African diaspora, the Black Atlantic, uh, about language and rhythm. So please take the floor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a great honor. So thanks to the Bali. Thanks for the for, for, for the very interesting uh, your, your talk on on form. Um, mine's going to be more on content and not so much um, reflecting directly on your work, but actually taking the cue from your work and particularly from um, Micro House of the Black Atlantic to say something about the Dutch context of Black Atlantic. Um, so some things will be familiar to people, some things won't, um, but here we go. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, the first, just get the framework in. This, this, this is a quote from, from Paul Gilroy, which you use in, um, which I, I took from, from Micro House. Uh, so striving to be both European and black requires some specific forms of double consciousness. However, where racist, nationalist, or ethnically absolutist discourses orchestrate, well, there's a, that's a typo, political relationships, so that these identities appear to be mutually exclusive. Occupying the space between them, or trying to demonstrate their continuity, has been viewed as a provocative and even oppositional act of political insubordination. So, um, the space between, um, between these identities, European identity and a black identity, that's what I'm going to talk about in, 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 the, in, the Dutch, in the Dutch context. So what are we talking about? And I, I don't want to be long, so I'm going to be quick and, and short, and probably sometimes too short. Um, this is sort of Dutch identity, the way it perceives itself in a way. Um, uh, clothing, uh, that's an image from a, from, from a movie, Soldat van Oranje. That's about the war, resistance to oppression. And that's uh, Johan Cruyff um, uh, playing against Argentina essentially a kind of ident Dutch identity um, summarized in a way, um, the European Dutch identity. Um, the black identity in Holland sort of falls together with Suriname, that's a country in Latin America, for those who don't know, a former colony of the Dutch. Um, I say, why, why do I say Suriname? Because in fact, in Dutch, the word Suriname, meaning a Surinamese person, is actually used synonym as a synonym for a black person even though we have people from all kinds of... The Suriname means a black person. Um, and this is sort of the context, uh, the colonial context in which that identity is sort of forged. So it's European. Um, now, this is another image of very much Dutch identity. Um, I, I think nobody will dispute the fact this is really Holland at its... Uh, you know, this, this is Holland, it's a, it's a cup of coffee and the cook, a cookie, a cup of coffee and a cookie. Um, which you give to people when you invite them in your house, which you, when, when everybody stops at, when in, in work framework, 11 o'clock we have a kopje coffee with the koekje. Um, so this is quintessentially Dutch and has been for, for, for hundreds of years. And the interesting thing about this is that nothing about this picture is Dutch. Absolutely nothing. The, the, the cup of coffee, yeah, it's imitation Chinese porcelain, which we call Delft Blue, but it's Chinese. So um, the coffee, and the sugar in the coffee are two products which could only be produced with slave labor in the past and which have become I, 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 part of the Dutch identity because the Dutch were able to actually exploit slaves and um, make that sugar and make that coffee and make the money that they could get from selling it worldwide. And the cookie, speculaas, like almost all Dutch traditional pastries for occasions is chock full of spices which could only be produced in a colonial system of exploitation and slavery. So this quintessentially Dutch picture is not Dutch, but it says a lot about Holland. And it says also a lot about, I guess, the Atlantic and how the Atlantic trade actually defined what Holland is today. Um, now I'm going to make a big jump. I don't have a lot of time. So this is now I'm in the 30s. So I talked about European and black identity element of black identity, so I said Suriname. This is a poster from, um, from the 30s in the Netherlands. It's a poster by the Musicians' Union. Uh, it says, Wordt geen musicus, een voor Nederlander uitstervend beroep. Don't become a musician. It is a, 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 the, the, that profession was almost extinct for Dutch people, and it represents a musician who's being threatened by a gramophone and by a black 
musician, essentially by what jazz music was bringing to the Netherlands in the years 20s and 30s. So we're talking about music and how music sort of reflects uh, a discourse about identity. I think this is a clear, very clear poster in terms of how it was perceived and also black identity was perceived in the Netherlands in terms of music in the 30s. Um, so yeah, another quote from Gilroy, which you, you used in, in the work. The Negro is no longer just America's metaphor, but rather a central symbol in the psychological, cultural, and political systems of the West as a whole. The image of the Negro and the idea of race, which it helps to found, are living components of a Western sensibility that extends beyond national boundaries, linking America to Europe and its empires. So we just saw the link between Holland and its empires. The transmutation of the African into the Negro is shown to be central to Western civilization, especially to the primitive, irrational, and mystical elements in European culture. Paul Gilroy. So we just saw in the previous picture the Negro, the African becoming the Negro, becoming a threat to Dutch identity. So taking the cue from this quote, uh, this is a picture of a Dutch family listening to the radio. Um, I show this picture because radio is of course a vehicle for transmitting music and was an important vehicle for, for passing music. And radio in Holland has a particular structure, but uh, actually up until the 80s, it was very much state controlled and people were allocated, organizations were permitted to use the radio for music. So you had um, not so much the state controlling the content, but it did control who had access. And it, 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 it's, it passed the access to different denominations. So you had a Protestant radio, a Catholic radio, you had a secular radio, you had these different. So um, this thinking about the radio and the way it sort of basically curated the music that was made available to the entire country because there was no commercial radio, um, influenced the impact of African diaspora culture and music in the Netherlands to a great extent. I'm not going to go into that in more detail because I don't have time, but I am moving on to the 70s when actually after the Second World War, migration started happening from the different former colonies of, of, of Holland. This is, these are pictures from the 70s when a big wave of Surinamese migration came to the Netherlands because Suriname gained its independence in 1975. Um, so you had these migrants um, and their children and, um, and not just Surinamese, of course, because you also had North African migrants. You had, you had migrants from other for Dutch colonies and former Dutch colonies from Indonesia, from the Moluccans. You had migrants from the different islands in the Caribbean. Um, but the basic image of the black migrant is the Surinamese migrant. Um, and they arrived in a country in which everything was curated and where their music was heard to a certain extent on pop radio stations. You had black music, of course. And of course, the music already had been influencing Dutch culture, particularly jazz music, completely transformed Dutch literature in the 50s. Um, but it was still elsewhere and not there. So they did not see their own representation in music and in culture. This is a picture from the 1980s. So it's essentially those children growing up. Um, the 1980s saw the proliferation of pirate radio stations. And particularly in the big cities, so in Amsterdam and in Rotterdam. And these radio stations, um, played almost exclusively African-American music and particularly club music. So I guess the, the, um, the music, disco after disco was declared dead. So we're talking about, we're talking about music made in the early 80s. Um, and it, was, it all came through uh, import record shops. Rhythm Import was one of them. You had two or three in Amsterdam. And these stations in the city, when you, were, when you would walk in town, when you would go to, to the shops, all the shops would be pumping this music from these illegal radio stations, which were being cracked down regularly. So this music came in, and it sort of a main line into the street culture of black youth in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, in these big cities. Um, Disco, what also came in with this music was hip hop. And now hip hop, of course, you had hits like Rapper's Delight, and so you had a couple of hits which would come in the, in the mainstream of, of, of popular music. But something else was happening in, in these radio stations. And so between these dance tracks and club tracks, 
um, you would hear tracks like this one. Um, can you please play the video? The first video. No, that's not the first video. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is an example of, this, this is a, a, one of the early hip hop tracks, Dougie Fresh uh, and, and Slick Rick, the show. It's beatboxing, it's very much raw street hip hop, and this would come in between lush disco tracks in this radio station. And this is how hip hop came to the black community in the Netherlands. Um, the 80s, this identity, these youths were making, were finding an identity which was outside of the Dutch identity, but also outside of the Surinamese identity of their parents. This, this American street music was what they identified with in terms of finding their own identities. Um, oops, there we go, next picture. Uh, end of the 80s, the big event in terms of identity and in terms of European and black identities being separated was actually football, soccer. Uh, this is the Dutch team that won the, uh, the, World Cup, the World Cup, the European Cup, at the end of the 80s. Um, and this team had uh, several Surinamese players. Um, all of them, of course, were immediately Dutch. So up until that point, black was Surinamese, even if it came from another country. And around that point, it shifted and black could also be Dutch. These were generally were considered genuinely Dutch, Dutch players because they won the European Cup for Holland. Um, the 90s was the, were the years when that kind of thinking sort of became more spread about. People talked about a multicultural society. Um, end of the 90s um, came the pushback. So these are two politicians. Um, he's slightly more recent, but I'm showing them together anyway. And that's Geert Wilders. That's, uh, uh, oh God, I forget his name. That's fine. <laughs> um, but both of them, um, um, I guess you could ex explicitly, ex explicitly uh, 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 racist platforms. Um, typically, though, they were part of the general discourse. So in the early 90s, um, uh, talk about, about, about the failure of multicultural society, talk about uh, uh, different concepts and also racist concepts. Were, were things which were talked about outside of politics. The end of the 90s in Holland meant it became part of the political discourse. It's the mainstream political discourse, the general political discourse. So that was a very, very strong pushback um, to the idea that Dutch identity could be something else than the European identity, could be something else entirely. Um, this is around the knots, right? 2000, 2001, 2000. Um, the most popular music in this period in time in Holland um, was Franz Bauer. Now, I know it's funny, but at the same time, what we have to realize is that Franz Bauer, um, at that time and with the album that he put out, um, broke every single record for music in the Netherlands, right? So he demolished the Beatles records, records for selling, selling records. He demolished Michael Jackson's record for selling records. He was by far the best selling artist in the Netherlands ever. And he stayed that for close to 13 years, which is a long time. Um, his big hit was this song. Um, yeah, volgende video alsjeblieft. 
Thank you. So I play a bit of these music videos because uh, Tony says quite correctly in his work that music also communicates things which go beyond text and explain. So that's why I think it's important to hear and to feel the music. In fact, it'd be best if you would dance to the music because that's where the message sort of really is. Um, but yeah, Franz Bauer, uh, again, um, by far the biggest selling artist in Dutch music recording industry. Demolished all the records um, until 2016. In 2016, um, another art artist, actually a group of artists, um, completely crushed his record and blew it completely out of the water. Um, Bruderliefde. Um, Bruderliefde. And they, um, with, with this song, uh, next video please. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, Bruderliefde. Now, this is a very exotic video clip, but these, all of these boys grew up, were born in Rotterdam, grew up in Rotterdam. They actually flew out, some of them for the first time, out of Holland to make this clip. Um, a couple of interesting things. Uh, the language in which they write their songs is Dutch street language actually based on Surinamese, right? So it's based on Surinamese, which, uh, Dutch street language, which is based on Surinamese, both in grammar and in use of particular words. Um, all the more interesting that they are not Surinamese. They're actually Cape Verdean, because there's a Cape Verdean minority living in Rotterdam due to the harbor. So um, nothing about what they make is typical or fits typically into any kind of exact category. Um, Wait, hold on, yes. So now another quote from Gilroy. Examining, which is of course in Tony's video. Examining the place of music in the black Atlantic world means surveying the self-understanding articulated by the musicians who have made it. The symbolic use to which their music is put by other black artists and writers and the social relations which have produced and reproduced the unique expressive culture in which music comprises a central and even foundational element. Okay, so as I said, they, their record still stands, right? They are, they are by far the best-selling artists in the Dutch recording industry. Um, there's a reason why they blew, um, uh, they blew Franz Bauer out of the water, not just because they sold very well, but also because they started shifting the way they counted record sales, and including the internet. Okay. Um, a self-understanding articulated by the musicians who have made it. I'm going to show you another clip by the same group made right after they, uh, uh, they had their huge hit. Uh, yeah, for the clip, as you It's a fact, that's what they're singing. It's a fact, our success is a fact. <laughs> 
Thank you. So, Bruderliefde, um, what you have to understand in understanding what their success means, it means that basically, because they counted the streaming, basically that I guess Dutch people under 25 completely identify, regardless of their ethnic background, identify with these Cape Verdean boys singing in Surinamese, coming from the streets of Rotterdam, all black, making black music in a black diaspora style. That says something about what the identity is of Holland today. That's what Holland is today. We identify with this. And we, I mean, as a Dutch people. And if it's not us, but it's the people under 25, have no problem. And in fact, um, this is saying something about hip hop, which is often categorized as a marginal current. It's actually now, right now, really the Dutch mainstream. Um, Spotify 2022, these are the artists, the top 10 artists in the Netherlands. Um, so of these top 10 artists, seven of them are hip hop artists. Only one is an American. The other six are all Dutch, rhyming in Dutch, rapping in Dutch, or rhyming in street Dutch, which is Surinamese elements. Um, this is the mainstream in Holland today. Um, yeah. That's the king of Holland. He's um, giving a safe elbow high five to Typhoon, uh, one of the big Dutch hip hop artists. This was Queen, Queen or King's Day uh, a year and a half ago, I think. Um, again, it is completely the mainstream. So we're talking about the influence of African diaspora music on Dutch culture. Um, uh, what can I say? Um, last thought, interesting one. I again go back to the quote of Paul Gilroy, the transmutation of the African into the Negro is shown to be central to Western civilization, especially to the primitive, irrational, and mystical elements of European culture. Now what's interesting is that The type of music which is now being made, so hip hop in Holland started, as I said, the music came in in the early 80s. Um, they started making Dutch hip hop with English lyrics in the 80s, 90s. Dutch lyrics came early 2000. Um, now, and you heard it in Buddha Lita's rhythm, it's not just the lyrics, the rhythms are not American hip hop rhythms anymore. They're African and Caribbean. And if you look now at what, what is popular in youth culture, um, the first picture is, uh, I'm a piano artist, which is uh, dance music, uh, a type of house music from South Africa. Second picture are Afrobeat artists. Um, if you know people 15, 16 years old now, they're all dancing to this music, um, listening to these lyrics, which are sung in languages that they don't understand, which was inconceivable 20 years ago in African languages. So, in a way, um, musically, we're going, looking back towards, actually, the African identity of the music. It's going to be interesting to see what that means in terms of identity and in terms of what the Black Atlantic means for our cultural future as a country. Okay, that's my talk. Completely different story. Yes. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because it's placing like the topic that you try to capture in Microhouse mm -hmm. completely into the Dutch European context. Um, would you like to react? I think my first reaction is that I've learned a lot, <laughs> you know, just from the you know careful attention to the evolution of the musical styles and how they relate and don't relate to maybe a specifically Dutch context, the ways in which you know, certain practices and ideas about practices from different parts of the diaspora have kind of functioned um, in specific circumstances for people for whom you could argue, I mean, it's one thing to say that American hip hop is global, but it's another thing to think about the specific ways in which um, hip hop has been brokered as a kind of identity trope for people in locations that I don't think anyone could specify. I find that absolutely fascinating. It's like the uses to which music can be put, not being necessarily even bounded by the self-understanding of the people who produce the so-called originals, yeah. as it were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, 
Because if you look at your uh, video uh, micro house, it's also like relating something to discussions about cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. about appropriation music. Could you elaborate a bit on what you try to say in that work about... Because it really reminded me of discussions about cultural appropriation, but it seemed as if you add something or that you reframe something that also has to do with the, the, the story of Maarten. Yeah, I think one of the things that I was interested in is the debate around, quote unquote, you know, who's, who originated techno, what context in which, you know, it can circulate and or should circulate in. And it's almost like, well, you could think about it in a kind of strict identitarian sense. But when you do that, you also run the risk of being reductive in certain ways about the conditions of possibility, not only for people on the ground making the music and receiving it, but also for its futures. And maybe I'm making a polemic that, you know, as much as we might want to control those flows and those uses, it's one thing to say that something is appropriated. It's another thing maybe to try to think in complex ways about the so-called origins of the form that you're talking about. Um, I don't think it's just a cliche that, you know, techno is, what is it, George Clinton and Kraftwerk meeting in an elevator. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> if you don't want to live in a world where that is, you know, a kind of condition of possibility, you know, or if you only want to stick to a specific historical narrative about the origin of a particular type of music, and that only, you know, it can only be made by certain people in certain places. It seems that, you know, there's a lot of history that would contradict that, including the history of like techno itself. It's like, it's not simple, you know, or a simple origin, nor is it, you know, um, an origin that one could say is one culture or one sexuality. There's always been multiple would be my argument and that we were probably going to see more, you know, complex hybridities, including more acu accusations around the question of cultural appropriation. But I don't know, some of them can be both positive and exceed any, you know, knowledge that one would have in a kind of historical or cultural sense. In a certain way, you know, my argument might be that's part of the point. It's almost like people who are not expected to have access to certain material and certain technologies do get access to it and do things that perhaps were not part of the intentionality of their, you know, initial construction. And that's part of the beauty of it as opposed to a limitation, but... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think, in fact, even the qualification of, okay, that this belongs to this group, is actually a very European way of thinking. Because if you look at the history of the music in the African diaspora, mm -hmm. it's all about appropriating. Now, of course, now I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the power dynamics the power of and oppressor the and interest behind the, the, yeah. that, that's, that's Because that, I think that's a real discussion about yeah. appropriation. But literally the way music travels and the way particularly in the culture of the African diaspora it's really about deep finding what you have and making it your own. So, so um, it's always been like that. And if, that could be electronic, but it could also be, uh, I mean, um, people don't always realize, for example, that dance hall music from reggae, which, you, which is sort of the base for reggaeton, you know, the... That that music, people say, so it's just reggae. It's not. Roots reggae is completely different. It's not the same, not the same source. In fact, the dance hall source is the quadrille, which was a dance yeah. form that the French peasants did um, in kind of a minuet type form. That's where, and, and uh, the, this is something I saw Robbie Shakespeare and Sly Dunbar explain in a documentary. It comes from quadrille because they were dancing, they, these were the, that was the party music in the uh, countryside in Jamaica. So, yeah, you know, uh, um, I think. I think the force of African diaspora culture is the fact that it's been able to move so quickly that it's essentially determined the entire landscape of popular music worldwide, a period. Yeah. Almost as though if there were no black diaspora um, practices, what kind of popular music would you have? You know, it's, it's not a question of like trying to, you know, synthesize and limit. It's more sort of like what what possibilities haven't been inculcated by those practices? 
or their derivatives. Yeah. And you know, you could make the argument that kind of as you were saying about methodology of using, you know, kind of received <laughs> materials, you know, you could say that anyone who takes those approaches has some interest and potential claim, you know, to those practices. It's not it's not like they weren't originally appropriated in a certain sense for particular, you know, yeah. from particular positions. So this idea that it can never, you know, appro cultural appropriation can never happen or should never happen. It's sort of like, how would that, you know, remedy the maybe strange facts that we find on the ground today? It's, you know, maybe it would be better to acknowledge that, you know, different people appropriate for different reasons and in different positions with different power results and financial gain as part of that equation. I mean, I especially kind of find interesting the title of the single, Hard Work Pays Off, mm -hmm. which is kind of like, well, yes, yeah. but maybe not, you know? It's... Um, I also want to go to the audience. So I have one question uh, related to this. Um, because you're an American artist, uh, but you also exhibit a lot in Europe. And I was thinking, how do you think about like your own work traveling in different contexts? Because Marte is showing a lot like how your this specific video really relates to a uh, European discussion, to a Dutch discussion. Uh, but you also sometimes get a critique like, um, should we always invite uh, Am American artists or American culture in a European context? Because that are two different things. Um, I'm just curious how you think about your own work in these different contexts and how you yeah, relate to that, actually. Wow. Well, you know, that's not something I can necessarily do alone or by mm -hmm. myself or for myself. I mean, I think it has been interesting to me that the reception of my work in Europe being mostly about America, mostly in yeah. English, has been of a different pitch um, than in the United States where I'm from. I think on some level it might be because maybe my interests and approaches um, may be more legible in a place that is not the United States, um, whereas I think the desires and expectations of my compatriots may be relatively different, or maybe they have a different idea about what American art can and should be. Um, when I was young and starting to practice, you know, a, well, a pretty well-known um, African-American art historian told me that there were no African-American media artists. Now, I knew that wasn't true when it was said, so it's, it's always complicated. And I think it's complicated there especially because, you know, there are certain notions about maybe what um, black or African-American art is. And, you know, my approach would probably be to say something like you were saying, Martin, that, you know, if you're using these methodologies, it doesn't matter necessarily what your subject matter is you have some um, interest in and perhaps debt to African-American cultural practices. So, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's only about that, but in part it must be about that. It's reception, I was gonna say, you know, the reception of the work, it's like I can't control it. I used to think that one could, you know, in a kind of old school way, I appear with the work and talk about it and contextualize it. But more often than not, the work kind of gets circulated in contexts that I have no direct control over, and I acknowledge that. Um, and I think that kind of sometimes leads to very interesting, you know, juxtapositions and confrontations, and I'm happy for those. Um, but yeah, why, you know, it's sort of taken so long for my work to be recognized, you know, in the place that I, you know, come from, and has received a different kind of reception here. I mean, you'd probably be as well positioned to try to answer that question as I would. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to try that now. But no, let's do that I, I don't later at the bar. No, I'm so. just saying. No, no. You know, it's like, <laughs> hmm, can I explain? Yeah. It? No, I understand. I mean, yeah. On a certain level, I think it does maybe have to do with difference, you know, um, and maybe an ability to sort of see certain differences um, and to have a different, maybe, you know, take or contextualization on those differences. Um, I don't think my work is great because I'm American or anything like that. It's just, you know, kind of material that I work, you know, from and with. Um, yeah. And I hope that, you know, it does promote an ability to see 
relations and contradictions in places that, you know, I'm not from, not part of that, you know, cultural history in a direct way, but, you know, kind of a, a kind of framework and a kind yeah. of pattern. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's like there's a, there's a parallel like like with house music. It's interesting that it started in Chicago as a local phenomenon and that these records were selling in Europe and these artists then had no idea because they, they weren't just... And, and now, of course, it'd be people like Beyonce and Drake are all making house records, s s sampling these classic house tracks, which were ignored by, by the pop world in the States, which were specifically for a subculture, which are now coming in on the main stage. The mainstream. Like, yeah. whatever, 30 years after they were actually came about, and they're coming through, passing all over the world, and then coming back to the States. So it's also some conversations are difficult in that framework, I think, mm -hmm. firstly, when they, when they deal with, um, yeah, with, with, with African-American culture. Yeah. Um, I'm looking a bit at the audience because you're listening here and maybe you have questions or things that you would like to add. So maybe you can uh, raise your hand and I come with the microphone so that people on the live stream understand as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, thank you for being here and all the presentations this evening. Something we haven't discussed yet, but I'm, I'm quite interested in is the mentioning of, and it maybe ties into this last um, discussion, is how the, your work is perceived, or at least its meaning. And, and you said that you're very interested in, in the affect that your work creates in recent years. What we haven't discussed yet is this sort of play between, on the one hand, a seeming neutrality which is involved in the work, the fonts, the colors, uh, the technology is very basic, and on the other hand, they're obviously very impactful meanings of the work themselves, but they seem to remain in between an outspoken, let's call it binary, if, if that maybe ties it into the American context more or not, and on, on the other hand, a kind of neutral, uh, there isn't always uh, the author of the quote in, in what you're seeing. So it, it seems to me that there is a play with that kind of expectation of an audience and their affect, into and into and from which position something is being said and reaching them. Could you say something a bit more about that, please? I mean, I think in a basic way, it is a kind of strategic placement of elements. In other words, I think one of the things that I hope to delay maybe in some of the works is a direct identification or claim of knowledge about who is speaking and from what position. Um, I like the sort of contradiction maybe between what appears to be directness and a kind of lag or a gap. Um, I think maybe it has something to do with my desire maybe to question this idea of we always know or should know who's speaking and from what position, as opposed to, you know, and often maybe in documentary practice, you know, certain male voices or, you know, maybe even contemporarily, um, certain female voices recruited to a production have that kind of neutralizing function. But I kind of like the idea that um, even in a, what appears to be a very simple and straightforward presentation, there's always maybe a question and maybe a little bit of doubt about who's speaking. Um, I think in some ways it kind of helps maybe the possibility of thinking critically about what the text says, as opposed to what we claim to know about who's saying it. Um, and maybe that also has something to do with, you know, questions of identity and how identity is formed and represented. That it's not quite so simple if you remove the face, for instance, and have to concentrate on what the voice is meant to say, or who is, you know, allegedly meaning to say this thing. So I, I like a little bit of delay and maybe a lot of, um, a certain amount of postponement of certainty in regard to who's speaking. Thank you. Is there maybe another question? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Koch, thank you for this dialogue. Uh, I would like to, uh, to ask us uh, in, this, in the same line, um, I feel uh, in one work, uh, we, 
we could see a certain uh, cynism perhaps in the background of it. Uh, it was the text, uh, I am sorry. Is it that meant uh, in a, a cynistic way because the American police could say that, could have said that because of uh, the, the, the death of some uh, black people on the street or I felt that also because I'm a German uh, with a German background because the politicians say that in Germany and I feel it also in, in, the, in the sense of uh, the Irish people in Londonderry when politicians said that because of the Bloody Sunday you know so uh, you, f you sometimes work also with cynicism um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't consider my, I'm, I consider myself maybe um, radically skeptical, but I try not to be cynical. Maybe because I feel like cynicism, how should I put it, is a, it's a, once, once you pose it and present it, it's kind of hard to um, take, it, take it away in a certain way. So I try not to be cynical. Although I try to be as skeptical as I can be. And I hope on a certain level that when people read the text that maybe they bring a certain dose of skepticism. In the case of the I'm sorry, um, I think in that particular work, what I hope to activate is the strange phenomena. Because I think if, the, if I have the right work in mind, um, it's basically someone who is being attacked by the police who says, I'm sorry, in certain, you know. And the, the kind of, again, I you know, often think about um, the, the timing and the relationships between statements. And one of the things that I found most compelling about that particular statement was the kind of movement back and forth between, you know, I'm sorry for triggering this incident, but on the other hand, I'm being hurt. And so that contradiction was really kind of maybe important and central to register. So, you know, you're right. It's the police who probably should be apologizing, but it's not the police who's uttering those words. Maybe a final question. Yeah, here. Yeah, does uh, specific music uh, talk to you about a specific subject, or is the music, is it, is it the subject that comes to you first, or is it the music that comes to you first? Um, probably in terms of order, subjects probably come first. But I think I may have said this earlier, I, I often choose music not um, ironically, but hopefully in ways that it will complicate um, the things that the text will say, or give a different sort of version or account of maybe something similar. So, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think it's, for me, it's always a kind of double or maybe sometimes even triple articulation where I know what the subject of the work is going to be, but often I have not decided on the specific text that I'm going to use. And so, Strangely enough, I'm thinking about, you know, maybe where the text will go, what the um, subject is. And then I will start thinking about music. And often music is the first thing that I lay down because it's almost like I know that maybe the text will be positioned in a particular way or from or come from a particular source. And it's maybe just my way of working. I, I want the sound to complicate or add something that the text does not explicitly say. Sometimes it's more, you know, it can be really direct, and other times I think it's more dispersed. Um, like for instance, in the case of um, Evil 16 torture music, it was more um, kind of a set of material that I wanted to juxtapose with the text because I thought the text kind of did a nice job in articulating both historical and theoretical um, arguments for and maybe even against 
the use of popular music in these things. And it seemed interesting to me to take snippets, not whole tracks, although gradually as the piece goes on, you get longer and longer passages from the music. But at least it starts off with a variety of clips from music from different contexts and different histories. And I was, interesting, I was interested in the fact that all of these things, at least on some level, had been documented as having been used in these contexts. And I was thinking, too, that people will be very familiar. Some people will be very, very familiar with some of this musical material, so much so that I didn't even have to play the whole track for people to have certain affective relations to that material. And so it was kind of about staging you know, that, that material in kind of a specific relation and context, which may not have been an ordinary one. You know, it's one thing to think about, oh, wow, these are my favorite tracks from the, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then to realize, oh, those two have been used in this other context. Um, and, you know, it's almost like thinking about ways of building relations that are not always um, straightforward and logical. You know, there may be relations that people are very, very aware of, um, but then there may be, you know, other relations that they perhaps are not consciously thinking about. Like with that piece in particular, I've had people say, I really love all those, you know, or a lot of those tracks. What do you mean that they have been? And it's sort of like, it's documented if you'd like to explore it. There's been a good deal of literature both in the popular press and in you know, maybe more specialized discourses about these uses. So it's me, but it's not. You know, it's not only me. Um, and part of it, I think, is that feeling that um, Tina Comp talks about, that feeling of implication, you know, as opposed to it just simply being music I love that it could function in radically different ways in radically different circumstances. And in that case, you know, I would even maybe go a little bit further and say, it's not the music, it's the use and the context. And so, you know, you may think that, you know, your relationship with music is yours personally and specifically, but then if you know about other contexts in which that same music has been used, I think it's helpful in some way to reposition and to think, oh, am I implicated then in this other use? Perhaps, perhaps not. But at least it's something worth considering, I think. Yeah, I think, I think we can go on for hours, but you flew in this morning and I can imagine that you're also a bit tired. <laughs> so I think uh, I round it up here, but uh, maybe we can have a drink at a bar and uh, talk with each other for a longer time. Uh, thank you so much, Maarten and Edwin, for thank sharing you your presentations. For your questions and your thank attention. you for your attention and give a very warm applause again for Tony. Um, Yeah, I would maybe uh, like to end with um, the, just the information that for two more days the exhibition is on view. So if you haven't seen it or you want to rewatch the video, please do. Uh, it's for two more days on Saturday and Sunday. And please recommend it to other people that you think they should see this. So thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you all.